first of all, I think I have to say that whether I'm still a lawyer is debatable. Uh, I normally say that as an excuse. Uh, but the reality is that although I have a legal background, my current activities are not so legal. And over time, I have moved uh, somewhat away from, uh, uh, from this field into more policy-related studies. And this is indeed what I'm doing at ESPI, the European Space Policy Institute, which is a think tank, the only European think tank devoted uh, to space uh, policy studies. But I wanted to say that I'm a little bit uh, worried about being here uh, today because you make the jump from uh, Thomas of Aquinas to Peter Hulsroy. <laughs> That's not easy. Um, and uh, I know that, uh, that if your expectations are Thomas of Aquinas, uh, then you will be disappointed uh, because my speech is going to be uh, somewhat more concrete down to earth but I hope that I will convince you that I'm also talking about uh, something quite important. And I wanted to say that I'm really very pleased with how Globart has chosen this topic about invisibility and visibility, because I think this uh, opens a, a multitude of angles where one can, uh, from which one can uh, look at it. And I will uh, adopt uh, one very specific one. So tonight we will hear Professor Sloterdijk, I think, talk about the future as being something invisible. And I will talk a little bit about how the present, in some respects, is inv uh, invisible, but should be visible. That's uh, the point uh, a little bit about uh, uh, humanitarian uh, telemedicine. So I will try to see if I can uh, operate this to demonstrate uh, what I mean by making things visible. So we go from the blank or the ugly, uh, or the ugly uh, logo of uh, SP. And I don't know, I hope you can see uh, the picture well because this is important to uh, illustrate my point. Uh, there, uh, although this has little to do with, uh, uh, little to do with uh, space, I have to say this picture is one of the ones that have impressed me the most for a very long time. So what you see is a little girl in her beautiful colorful dress lying on the floor in Western Africa, uh, and she is dying from Ebola. And if you look at the top uh, part of the picture, then you see what a desolate, desperate situation it is, because there you have somebody else uh, also on the floor, uh, probably already dead. And if you look at her eyes, you understand uh, what I mean. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of motivation when I'm talking about uh, humanitarian telemedicine, uh, that we have to make visible uh, that on, in our wealthy society, we have pockets of despair uh, and uh, pockets of uh, uh, avoidable death where we ultimately have an ethical and uh, a human obligation to help. So I will now move a little bit into, uh, into the philosophical realm, and uh, I think some of the previous speakers will be uh, debating whether I know what I'm talking about when I'm saying that visibility is, per definition, subjective, because they will sort of, like Kant, say, ah, das Ding and sich and all that. Uh, so the, uh, a thing is visible uh, whether you look at it or not which I, we can have a long debate about, but that's not the purpose uh, today. The purpose is that things uh, you can see, but you only see them if you choose to see them. Uh, so somebody uh, earlier today talked about how we are selective in, uh, uh, in seeking knowledge and so on, but we are also selective in what we decide to look at uh, and selective in uh, what we uh, decide to do uh, when we see something. So. So this uh, image, of course, shows you that, again, Ebola suddenly becomes relevant for us, that we choose to look at it, not because it is in West Africa, but because it is suddenly in, uh, of all places, Texas. So suddenly it becomes relevant for us because it moves closer. Is this a good ethical approach, not to look at uh, the girl we looked at before because she is not close and that she might not infect us? I, of course, uh, believe not. 
So I think when we are talking about this topic of uh, invisibility and visibility, then one of the obligations on us uh, in our current society is to choose our topics well uh, and make sure that when we choose these uh, topics well, that we also uh, use all our means uh, to help. And there, technology is uh, a potential tool. Uh, and I will come back to it and not an end in itself. So this is uh, the introduction uh, to humanitarian telemedicine. So I hope I've convinced you that the topic actually has something to do with invisibility uh, and uh, visibility, because ultimately telemedicine, of course, creates visibility because it can create a link uh, over a long distance between patients and doctors. So doctors can be far away and the patients uh, can be in their home uh, setting. So this is of course a fantastic uh, quality which we use in many different situations. You look at it in Norway and you, uh, you see that because of the nature of the country you uh, use telemedicine to reach patients that otherwise would have to travel far distances and so on. So the, this ability of telemedicine to link patient uh, and uh, medical expert over, uh, over great distances is uh, a fantastic possibility. And you see the military is using it, et cetera, et cetera. So we know that it is very sturdy uh, battlefield situations. You have uh, telemedicine. So from the technology perspective, there is not a challenge. The challenge is how do we use it? And uh, when I'm talking about humanitarian telemedicine, uh, then uh, what I mean by this is that rather than just linking a patient uh, with a doctor, we are talking about linking a patient in a desperate uh, situation uh, with a doctor uh, who is in a region where we have a good supply of doctors. So it's a question of, have, of linking undersupplied regions medically undersupplied regions uh, with regions where we have an abundance, you might argue, of uh, doctors. And this can take place in different uh, situations. So you can have a natural disaster. Haiti is sort of the classical example where it, uh, humanitarian telemedicine uh, would be applied. Uh, so uh, suddenly, because of the suddenness of the disaster, the medical community is not uh, fully uh, deployed uh, in, uh, in the location itself. And you can then create connections to doctors uh, far away. But what is, I think, more important in terms of what we can do in the future to avoid pictures uh, like the first one I showed you uh, is to link regions which have a, chronical, a chronic disaster, so a chronic undersupply uh, of uh, medical experts. So patients in those regions uh, with uh, doctors uh, uh, in regions uh, or in, uh, link them with regions where we have uh, a lot of uh, doctors. So the example that one can imagine is that you have rural Africa settings uh, where there is almost no access uh, to medical expertise and you link them with doctors in uh, Vienna, London, Paris, where we have uh, a lot of doctors. And uh, then you say, yes, uh, but doesn't this already exist? Yes, this does to some extent uh, exist. So what we have seen in humanitarian telemedicine in the past is that you link a doctor uh, in a developing country with an expert uh, in, uh, in the rich world. It's uh, what we call secondary uh, care. So you, get expert you give expert advice to the doctor on the ground. And this is something very valuable and this is certainly something uh, that we must uh, pursue further. But if one can say it in this sort of cruel way, the, uh, the low-hanging fruit that we can harvest in this is to link uh, patients uh, that have no access to doctors at all on the ground uh, with doctors uh, in the rich world. So we can allow doctors in Vienna uh, or London uh, to be the first port of call of a patient in rural Africa who will otherwise likely die. Uh, so uh, I will come to the problems uh, in this and I can see some of your brows uh, uh, raised in this. Uh, but the idea is here really to use the tool to make uh, distance uh, irrelevant. Would, uh, do we have 
uh, sort of the institutional uh, possibilities of doing that. Yes, obviously, if you see how many uh, people, are, uh, how many doctors are volunteering for Doctors uh, Without Borders, etc., etc., we know that the medical community has a great volunteering spirit here. But not everybody can go uh, for a year to Ghana uh, and, uh, and operate uh, in a rural uh, setting. And telemedicine allows us to draw uh, the goodwill of the medical community into this uh, effort uh, without having to make such a dra uh, dramatic life change. So telemedicine will allow a volunteer in London or in uh, Vienna uh, to donate a couple of hours a week uh, to do primary uh, care, to provide the first diagnosis uh, to a patient in uh, rural Africa. Uh, or we can create specific institutions where you have uh, uh, humanitarian telemedicine experts who are doing this only uh, as their only job, uh, but they are then doing it from afar, uh, not uh, in the rural setting. So you can then say, but why is Peter talking about this? Because does this have anything to do with space? And he's supposed to be a space policy person. Yes. Uh, it does have something to do with space, but I have to say, although I'm working for a space policy institute, I'm not a technology freak, uh, or I'm not a space technology freak at least, because I don't really care whether the uh, humanitarian telemedicine works via the internet and it uh, runs uh, via cable uh, or broadband uh, uh, high, uh, fiber or whether it works via, via uh, satellites. What we know, and this is my excuse for doing this uh, as part of uh, the task of uh, the European Space Policy Institute, is that there are certain settings where you can only create this bridge between need uh, and uh, supply uh, by satellite. So you, uh, you can have a truck uh, which has a VSAT uh, connection and uh, you can create uh, the link even from the most uh, difficult to access uh, locations. So you see that here at the bottom. Uh, this is not advanced technology, and I have uh, deliberately chosen a rather primitive uh, truck here uh, to, uh, to make it clear to you that this is something uh, which is not a luxury thing. This is something which is perfectly uh, possible. And what you see here graphically is also how it uh, works. And it is really so simple that I don't need to spend a lot of time uh, to discuss this, because you have the volunteer uh, who, my, uh, who would, in my case, not be a doctor, with a patient in front of a telemedicine uh, 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 suitcase. Uh, and uh, the data is transmitted to the two doctors uh, sitting comfortably in their office uh, in, uh, in my example, uh, Vienna. So yes, you can overcome some of the, uh, some of the terrible deficits in the number of doctors uh, in uh, developing countries uh, by linking them uh, to doctors of goodwill uh, in uh, the rich world. So. Uh, is it as easy as I'm uh, suggesting? Well, uh, perhaps it, uh, we have to look at this uh, more uh, critically. Uh, because what I'm suggesting is that you can have a patient in rural Africa who has never had a cell phone uh, in his or her hand. Uh, and uh, this person could be helped by a doctor in Sweden. Uh, how would this patient trust the advice that you would get via such a high technology uh, arrangement? This is a great uh, issue. Uh, and uh, there we need to make sure that there are interlocutors on the ground uh, which can gain uh, the trust of the ones that we are trying to help, even if they are not doctors. So we know that there are issues on this, there are issues that we have uh, to, uh, to tackle on this. And one has to say there are also issues on the other side, on the supplying side, uh, because doctors who are here in Vienna in Akaha uh, are used to providing world-class care uh, all uh, day long. 
Then they go down for two hours in a hub in Akaha, uh, and they uh, uh, they uh, provide uh, uh, first uh, diagnosis in rural Africa, where the tools are not the same, where the, uh, the diagnosis cannot be as precise as uh, he would do in his uh, normal uh, job. So this is a cultural transition which is not easy. It is easier perhaps for the doctors who go to, uh, to the field with uh, uh, doctors without borders because they know that they are in a completely uh, foreign setting. But doing it uh, in a moment, uh, making the transition uh, from providing world-class care to uh, provide care, uh, which just may, uh, will make do, that is a hard uh, transition. But what are the rewards? And this is what we are always uh, thinking about here. The reward is ultimately that so many people uh, will not die uh, 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 the easily avoidable uh, death. And that is what must motivate us and must motivate uh, the doctor that yes, we cannot by this tool provide perfect health care. We cannot overcome the overall bridge, uh, the overall divide uh, between what uh, health care we have and what they have. But we can avoid the easily avoidable uh, death, such as death from diarrhea, where, where it is so simple to diagnose. So the patients, of course, always know they have uh, diarrhea. That's not uh, the problem. Uh, but the remedy is very simple. We know that millions have been saved by being uh, given ORS, the oral uh, rehydration uh, supplement. So, so there is an easy, low-cost solution. In rural Africa, the solution is not always available. And what we must make possible is that doctors who can do this very easily, uh, that they get uh, the possibility of doing so, and that uh, the patients, uh, with all the reluctance they might have, uh, will be given this opportunity to be ultimately saved. So what I'm saying is, that ultimately, we come back to visibility, that seeing is helping. What we are talking about here is the simplest sort of technology, uh, where we just need a video uh, conference facility to be linked uh, to the patient. And a lot of these deaths uh, can be avoided by the doctor saying, but it is clear you have diarrhea, take ORS, and you have some uh, tropical uh, illness, we have a simple uh, remedy. Others we will not be able to save uh, by this. But that's not a reason not to save the ones that we can save. So I will just demonstrate to you that I'm not a uh, technology sealer because I have to say I don't, I'm not so concerned about the technology involved in this. There's no challenge in this. We know that it can work. You know, it can work in the most hostile uh, environments. And what we must remember generally, and also in this case, is that technology is an enabler. And what it should enable here is that the medical community can do what it really, I think, wants to do, namely help those uh, that are in the direst of uh, needs. So this is what we must achieve. But I now sign, uh, sound perhaps very naive, uh, and perhaps I am a naive, uh, and perhaps I am naive even if I'm a lawyer. Uh, so we are normally not accused of this uh, professional weakness, but uh, okay, I take uh, the possibility. So what we want to do as uh, next steps, and I would be very happy if some of you uh, would uh, accompany us in that process, that we will, in, uh, hopefully in the first quarter of, uh, of uh, 2015, we will make an in-depth conference uh, where we will uh, hopefully together with the European Commission uh, where we will uh, look at the cultural issues that I have uh, addressed a little bit here, uh, where, we will, uh, where we will look at uh, the, the also legal issues, where we will also try to see how can we further proceed on this. So I believe that one has to be cautious, uh, so that one has to uh, make a pilot project narrow, uh, where we try to assess, is this uh, just a good idea on paper, or is it also a good idea in reality? We have potential good partners on this, the Poverty Lab of MIT, I hope to get uh, involved in this, to evaluate that this is actually workable, that it is uh, the best way of reaching out, that there is the best cost-benefit uh, uh, correlation uh, in this. 
I know uh, you, uh, uh, I am running out of time, but I have to do something. Uh, and I will leave humanitarian telemedicine and talk about uh, the general uh, engagement of uh, the artistic world uh, towards, uh, uh, towards the sort of problems I'm talking about here. And this is, this is again, I hope it plays, yeah? One of the most effective A child dies completely unnecessarily as a result of extreme poverty every three seconds. There we go. That's another one. Somebody's daughter. Somebody's son. And the thing is, all these deaths are avoidable. Effective uh, outreaches to uh, try to remedy uh, global ill. And I have to say this video was from 2005. Uh, we have made a lot of progress here. Uh, there's still a lot to do. Stefan Hessel talked about time uh, for outrage. I don't like outrage because this is aggressive, but there is still a very strong uh, need for action. And uh, since I can address uh, the, uh, the artistic community here, we also have to remember that there is perhaps a, spe a specific obligation on the artistic uh, community here. There is a long history uh, of the arts bringing our focus bringing the visibility on the issues, such as my countryman uh, Anderson Nexu with Pelle the Conqueror, such as Alan Payton with Cry the Beloved uh, Country. Uh, Africa still cries. Uh, we need to do something. And if you want to accompany us, uh, then you can find a lot of material on our website. We have made an in-depth uh, report on this, and I hope to see you at our conference, and I hope that you will also follow with interest and perhaps with participation the pilot project that we will ultimately make.